Hello and welcome to the first part of my Oddworld review series marathon where we're going to be taking a look at the four main games released in the Oddworld series. If you want to know more about why I'm doing this and about my general passion for the series, then check out my Oddtober announcement video. But for now, we're going to be taking a look at the first game released in the Oddworld series, Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. Oddworld Abe's Odyssey was released in 1997 and developed by Oddworld Inhabitants for the PS1 and PC. While the PC version of the game is great and runs quite a lot faster than the PS1 version, we're going to be using the PS1 version of the game. Just because it's the version I'm more used to, and to be honest, I prefer it because I don't really like using the keyboard for games like this, and because the PC version does have some quirks that I don't like. For example, this icon that appears telling you when you've got a checkpoint, which kind of very slightly breaks the immersion. The game is a 2D cinematic platformer, similar in design to Another World, Flashback or Prince of Persia, where you control a humanoid character who for the most part lacks any abilities that wouldn't be possessed by an average person. This means that typically, characters in this genre are weak, they die from single enemy attacks or even from long falls, and they lack the ability to perform fancy jumps or manoeuvres. However, what separates Abe's Odyssey from the other games coming out in this genre at the time is that Abe isn't a human, but rather is a Madokan who lives on a planet called Oddworld. So let's take a look at our introduction to the game's universe. As soon as we start the game, the atmosphere is laid on thick. I mean, literally when the piracy warning appears, we've got some absolutely superb sound design. I mean, what other game can make a piracy warning this atmospheric? The sound design then starts building up and becoming more threatening as the game's opening and eye dents play out, and instantly we know that this game is going to be dark and maybe even somewhat scary. And we know all of this before we've even seen anything about the actual game. I mean, just listen to this. This sound design gives me goosebumps every time I hear it. The production value presented by this game is amazingly high and we aren't even on the main menu yet. And it's no surprise that upon getting to the menu, this high production value continues. We see Abe climb up and stick his ugly mug through a hole and greet us, instantly letting us know he's no threat and that he's the main character of the adventure. While navigating the menu, Abe interacts with us, and I always loved this. Not only is it quirky and fun, but if you access the GameSpeak menu, you can familiarise yourself with the somewhat complicated in-game communication controls, while getting to see Abe's animations as he acts out your button presses. This of course is a fun little extra thrown into the game and acts as a nice tutorial, but it also gives Abe a lot of character by allowing you to see his expressions, and means you can picture what he looks like while talking, even during the gameplay where you can't see him this clearly. Upon actually starting the game, we're asked if we want to play one player or two player, and I really don't particularly see the point in this. Rather than being a proper two player mode where you play simultaneously with someone, the two player mode basically just means that when one player dies, the other player picks up where the first player left off. So really, you could achieve this same thing by just passing the controller along when you die. It's not really a problem because it's just an optional extra, but still. Even the loading screen has personality injected into it, with a humorous message for us all while we wait. It's seriously impressive how this game has already completely set its tone, and this has happened before the game's even started. From its opening, to its menu, and even its loading screen, we know that this game is going to be dark and maybe even a bit scary, but with a lovable main character, and that also has a sense of humour to balance everything out. What other games are capable of establishing this much before even seeing a cutscene or gameplay? Not many. 
It's at this point where the game actually begins and we see the first proper cutscene. And my god, look at these cutscene graphics. This is seriously next level stuff. I don't know how they got cutscenes looking this good on PS1 hardware and in 1997, but they did it and it looks incredible. Not only is the general quality amazing, but the artistic direction, lighting, background details, voice acting and every little thing is absolutely incredible. This sort of quality was unprecedented at the time and this game truly showed the world what storytelling in games was capable of being. Anyway, the story of the game is being told from the perspective of Abe, who's a floor waxer at a meat processing plant called Rupture Farms. He and his Madokum friends are all kept as slave labour and are being manipulated into believing they have good lives here while they help the superiors destroy the environment and literally cause entire species to go extinct in order to create tasty consumables for the masses. Abe has done something extremely bad and is about to be confronted by the boss of Rupture Farms, Mullock the Gluckin, and the rest of the game is a flashback where Abe is telling us what happened. So while waxing the floors one night, Abe comes across a board meeting where Moloch and a few other Gluckens are talking about how profits are dropping. They've already made a species called Meechers go extinct, and people just aren't buying scrab cakes and paramite pies like they used to. So Moloch's solution? A new and tasty treat called Madokum Pops, which by the way appear to just be Madokum heads impaled on a sharp stick. Abe is suddenly shocked into realising what his bosses are truly capable of. They'll stop at nothing to make more profit, and he's jolted into action to not only escape Rupture Farms, but save his friends as well. Immediately, Abe is spotted running away, and becomes a wanted... man, I guess? And then the game begins. I mean, what can I say about the story here? This is an incredible plot setup, presented amazingly, and with enough metaphors you could shake a stick at them. But even ignoring the mirror images to our own world, the surface storyline is amazing too. We're presented with a flawed character who's about to go on a journey of self-discovery and go through a character arc to achieve his goal. We're also introduced to the main bad guy, so there's a constant threat hanging over our heads. While by today's standards this isn't really too impressive, bear in mind that this kind of complicated narrative, presented this well and with this much going on beneath the surface, was practically unheard of. A lot of people say Metal Gear Solid was the first truly cinematic game they played, but Oddworld Abe's Odyssey was right here, doing it a year before. So the game begins, and instantly there's a secret passage on literally the very first screen. Which actually leads me nicely onto the first thing that I like about this game. I love how the secret passages not only supply you with additional optional challenges, with some of the secret areas being the most difficult areas of the entire game, but it also adds replayability because you'll want to find all of the hidden Madokans and rescue them on subsequent playthroughs. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, and let's instead continue through the main game. So within the first few seconds of gameplay, we're introduced to the main threat of the game, Sligs. These creatures work for the Gluckens as the security force of Rupture Farms, and have been ordered to kill Abe on sight. They're also seen keeping the other Madokum workers in line, making them docile and fearful, perfect for a slave labour force. One shot from these Sligs, and you're dead so they pose quite a big threat to Abe. Luckily, Abe isn't completely defenceless and has the ability to chant and possess Sligs, giving you control over them and their abilities. This leads me on to another thing I love about this game. All of the species found here have their own quirks which are implemented into the gameplay through strengths and weaknesses. So while playing as a Slig, the main strength is obviously the fact that you have a gun. So by using this, you can kill other Sligs and clear areas of threats to Abe. A Sligs main weakness is that they can't jump, so this limits how far you can take them, and to get over gaps or up onto ledges, you'll need to be Abe. Sligs have other strengths too, but I'll get onto those a bit later. It's here where one of Abe's strengths also comes into play. Abe has the ability to talk and to interact with other Madokans. While the communication mechanics could be seen as fairly rudimentary today, 
You can still have a lot of fun with this, and it's nice being able to interact with different inhabitants and see how they respond to you. It also makes the Madokans feel more real, and you as a player feel more incentivized to rescue them all, because they aren't just a collectible, but real living things that you can interact with. So, it just ends up adding a lot of weight to what Abe is actually doing. <laughs> Wait. A lot of the time, communication with the Madokans will just boil down to you saying follow me, and then leading them to safety. It might have been nice to have a few other ways of communicating that actually affected the gameplay, but still, the optional stuff we can do still adds a lot of charm to the experience. As you progress through Rupture Farms, a ton of new obstacles will be thrown at you, from timed jumping sections, stealth areas, grenade throwing sections, making Madokans follow you through meat grinders, bombs that need to be deactivated with a timed button press when they go green, and loads more. The amount of variety in this first bit of the game is amazing, and almost every screen offers a new challenge that keeps you invested and experimenting with Abe's moveset. Eventually you'll come to a dead end after riding a train carriage, and what I love about this is the mysteriousness of this situation. What's beyond this door, and how big is the Rupture Farms facility beyond what we're seeing right now? It keeps your intrigue up, because throughout the adventure you're still left wondering what's behind it, and if you'll be returning at some point. Ignoring this dead end for now though, we eventually reach a sign which says if we leave, all 28 Madokans in this area will be killed. Which lets us know the threat against the Madokan race is real, but also tells us there are in fact 28 Madokans here. Meaning that if you've missed some secrets, you'll know to go back if you want to get them all. Continuing on, we escape the interior of Rupture Farms and enter the Free Fire Zone and the Stockyards. Here we see even more gameplay mechanics thrown at us, most notably motion sensors which scan Abe and if he moves he'll be killed by a bomb, and rocks which are thrown like grenades but obviously don't explode. So these rocks are used more as distractions, or alternatively to make mines blow up from afar. Then there's also our first look at two new species, Scrabs and Slogs. Both of these species get elaborated on later in the game, but something I found interesting is how they're both presented as being very animalistic at this point, simply spotting you and then straight away running after you and attempt to kill and eat you. However, later in the game they're given much more depth, which I feel may have been a conscious design decision that's underappreciated. Like the way you see these species as simply being an obstacle and nothing more than a mindless beast here reflects Abe's view of them, sort of like he sees them as inferior and worthless. But later on when they become expanded more, he sees them as being more complex than that and appreciates the world more because of the journey he's been on. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I feel like it could be that this was an intentional decision. I think now's a good time to take a bit of a rest from the gameplay, and speak a bit about the in-game graphics. By this point we've seen a fair bit of the game, and I think we can now say that these graphics are truly amazing. While yeah, obviously the character models have dated because this is a fairly early PS1 game, I still think the actual animation of them is really good. The way Abe sneaks, walks and runs all feel different because of the animations and the sound effects used for his footsteps on different surfaces and that change depending on his walking style. This is very much appreciated, and then there's also the way that he skids to a hole after running which gives an impression of speed, and also shows how Abe can be a bit clumsy too. But the main impressive thing here has got to be these backgrounds. Look at this. You could pick any random background from this game and it would be a piece of art worth framing and hanging up. The detail and the scale presented is jaw-dropping. Some of the backgrounds even have movement, which makes Rupture Farms and other areas feel like real places rather than being flat and static. The use of colour is also incredible here. Despite being a bleak game, it's visually engaging, 
With purple skies filled with distant moons and planets contrasting with the green light pollution seen in the sky earlier, and then this contrasts with the greys and browns of the interior of Rupture Farms. It's incredible, and later on in the game there's even more variety too. A background detail I've always liked is how when you begin your escape away from Rupture Farms, the towers in the distance look like Glucken heads with red eyes, watching over you and adding this ominous presence, almost like they could see you at any second. There's also gruesome details where you can see Madokan corpses on spikes, seemingly failed escape attempts displayed to put off any other Madokans thinking of freeing themselves. It's pretty twisted stuff. Anyway, Abe finally escapes and spots a distant moon that inexplicably has his handprint on it, maybe implying that he has a destiny greater than simply escaping Rupture Farms. Before being able to contemplate this too much, his footing slips and he falls, knocking himself unconscious, or maybe even dead. Either way, while in this state, a strange Madokan wearing a mask appears, named Big Face, and he tells Abe of his higher purpose. Abe is the chosen Madokan whose fate is to rescue Oddworld's inhabitants from the Glucken's industrialization efforts. But before he's able to do this, he needs to go to the ancient temples of Scribania and Paramonia and complete several tests to prove himself worthy of being the saviour of the Madokans. No pressure then. So Abe gets up and visits the lands of Paramonia and Scribania, which are accessed by him going through an ancient Madokan temple called Monsaic Lines. It's here where we're introduced to the whistle mechanic, which is another aspect of the game-speak communication in the game. The premise is simple. You hear a native Madokan do a whistle tune, and then you copy it, and they either let you past, give you access to spirit rings which blow up any bombs present on the screen by chanting, or activate some sort of contraption, like a lift. These whistle puzzles are used through the whole game from here on out, and while I enjoy them because they give more complexity to the game speak rather than just saying hello, follow me and wait all the time, I do have a bit of an issue with it. When you come across a Madokan who gives you spirit rings, you do the whistle and he gives them to you. Great. But then if you need the spirit rings again, you have to go through the whole whistling process again. And I just feel like they should have just have instantly given you the rings after you've done the whistle the first time. It just feels like a little bit of a waste of time having to do that again. But this is only a small gripe in the grand scheme of things. Getting to the end of Monsaic Lines sends you to a dead end, which is protected by loads of sligs and bombs, and there's no way Abe can get past without being instantly killed. He's told that by completing his trials in Scribania and Paramonia, that he'll be given access to the power of the Shrikel and be able to pass this area. This keeps intrigue high because it must be pretty powerful to be able to let us get past this much security. So this informs us of a reward for doing the trials and makes us want to complete them even more. So it's here where we can pick either Paramonia or Scribania to go to first, which adds a non-linear aspect to the game design. Both Paramonia and Scribania are drastically different to any environments we've seen so far. Paramonia is a huge forest area with wooden structures standing tall in the background, while Scribania is a blistering hot desert area with a stone temple at its centre. In these areas we meet a new friend called Elam, who looks kinda like a camel, and Abe can ride him to go a lot faster than usual and jump way further too. Plus Elam follows Abe and gets upset when told to wait, and I love him. Wait. <laughs> Plus, he loves honey and gets distracted whenever he sees it, forcing Abe to lead swarms of bees to him to get his attention again. But it's done with good intentions, I promise. <laughs> so Abe and Elam make their way through tons of puzzles and enemies, only to part ways just before Abe enters the temple areas, and I always thought there should have been cutscenes or something here to show Abe saying goodbye to his new friend. But there's kinda just nothing, and it comes across like Abe doesn't really care. But I care. I want to see Abe sad to leave Elam behind. 
You know something that bugs me? In the demo for this game, there was a product advertised called Elam Chubs. However, in the finished game, I've always assumed that Elam was the actual name of the creature, rather than being its species. So, Abe is a Madokan, and Elam is a whatever species. This is backed up by this sign here, which reads, Elam likes honey, but hates bees. You might say that Elam could be plural for multiple Elams, like the plural of sheep is sheep, and not sheeps. But even then, the sentence still doesn't make sense, because it should read Elam like honey, but hate bees, rather than Elam likes honey, but hates bees. Now, the poster for Elam Chubs was only in the demo, and was removed in the final game, so I suppose they could have retconned this? However, in the remake of Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, called New and Tasty, the poster for Elam Chubs is back. So I now feel like Elam has been retconned again to be the species name rather than the name of this one creature, which to be fair does make sense because I don't know how Elam would get from Scribania to Paramonia or vice versa unless it was a different creature. But either way, let me know what you think in the comments. Is Elam the name of this one creature, or is it the species name? Let me know your thoughts. So I wipe my tears away as Abe leaves Elam, and we go through a short section before entering the inner sanctum of the Paramonia and Scribania temples. These areas are laid out like a series of short puzzle rooms, and to open the way out of the temple, you'll need to light a flintlock in all of these rooms. Despite being laid out the same, Paramonia and Scribania feel completely different to each other, in no small part due to the fact that Paramonia features Paramites, and Scribania features Scrabs. Paramites are quite complex creatures. Rather than straight up attacking you like a slog would, Paramites are actually friendly when they're on their own, and won't attack you unless they're backed up against a wall. However, if there's two or more of them, they instantly become aggressive, and it's best you run for your life. And seeing as Paramites can spin webs and drop down from the ceiling, they can be quite unpredictable, which keeps you on edge for the whole time that you're in Paramonia. The Paramites are awesome, and some of the puzzles used with them are amazing. As you can imagine, them only becoming a threat when there's two of them is used to great effect, and you sometimes have to use meat to bait them into switching places with you, so you don't accidentally back them up against walls and make them feel threatened. Despite having quite a horrific design, they're kinda cute as well, don't you think? No? Just me? Okay then. Scrabs have been seen earlier in the game, but it's here where they get expanded on, and we learn that they're actually extremely territorial. Meaning that if there's ever two of them in one place, they'll prioritise fighting each other to the death, and ignore anything else going on around them. Basically allowing you to bait them into each other, and then sneak past safely. This mechanic lends itself well to some interesting level designs and puzzles, as you would expect. One of the absolute greatest things about this game is how every single area introduces so much new content to the game. Even at this stage, new ideas are constantly being thrown at us, and it's seriously impressive. The balance between introducing new mechanics while also still developing the mechanics enough to become challenging is seriously great, and a lot of games don't get this balance right. After clearing Paramonia and Scribania, we go through a nest area which is a mad rush through a long obstacle course filled with angry Paramites and Scrabs, which will test all of the platforming skills you've learned up until now. If you survive both of these, you'll get scarred on the back of your hands by Big Face. What an amazing reward. Thanks for that. These aren't just plain old scars though, and actually give Abe the ability to transform into the Shrikel, a godlike creature which is a combination of a Scrab and Paramite, and can shoot bolts of electric to destroy everything in its path. Now he can return to Rupture Farms and shut it down for good, putting up some serious resistance to the Gluckens who have gone unopposed for too long now. Something to point out at this stage is that the game can be quite difficult, and you will die a lot. 
This wouldn't be too much of a problem, but if you die, the game has a tendency to force you to go back ages. Like sometimes to the beginning of the entire area you are on. Meaning if it's a big area, you could have to repeat entire puzzle sections or platforming sections, and if you've already done them, it can feel a bit tedious. The solution for this is obviously just to have more checkpoints, but this remains a constant problem throughout the rest of the game to be honest, and it's quite bad. It wasn't really a problem up until we got to Paramonia and Scribania, because the game was relatively easy back then. But now the difficulty is ramping up? Yeah, it can feel extremely harsh. Having said that though, I like how death actually has a consequence. It's like in Resident Evil where you die and go back to the last time you saved. Which makes you think more about saving your game because you can only do that a limited amount of times and in specific areas. But with Resident Evil, you effectively choose where your checkpoints are, so if you slip up and die and go back ages, it feels more like your fault, whereas here, you don't choose where the checkpoints are, which makes it feel like it's the game's fault, which isn't helped by how some of the deaths in this game can be the result of trial and error sometimes. Despite dying sometimes being annoying though, there was this one point in the game where I died and it was actually pretty funny. There's these spirit guides where you chant and it gives you advice one word at a time. So I did that and was reading the message which slowly says, watch out for the bat. Only it's timed in such a way that you die pretty much as soon as the message finishes to a bat that's flying around the screen. It got a chuckle out of me because it felt like a bit of a troll. But at the same time, it was my fault for not moving out of the way of the bat first. I don't know, I just found it pretty funny. It's that sort of dark humour the game uses throughout that makes it so entertaining to experience. Abe eventually returns to Rupture Farms after backtracking his way through a harder version of the Stockyards and Free Fire Zone, only to discover that Rupture Farms has dramatically increased its security since he escaped. Luckily, you now have the power of the Shrikel to put to use. However, you stopped from being too overpowered because you don't always have access to the Shrikel, and are given a single use of it by rescuing Madokans in specific places. An aspect of the level design I really didn't like at this point was this bit where there's an electric fence, and it's not made clear that you can deactivate it. I actually went and finished the game, only to find I had about 20 Madokans missing. So I went back to an earlier save and discovered that by pulling this lever on the other side of the level, you could deactivate the electric and backtrack even more. What made this even more annoying was that after rescuing all the Madokans, I looked at a guide to double check I had all of them, only to find I was missing three, despite being sure I had got them all. I'm not entirely sure if this was just me missing a secret, or if the game's counter had glitched or something, but I decided to just reload and try again a third time. And guess what? Yet again my path to 100% was halted because of a glitch where I got a checkpoint after spawning some sligs in this room. But I didn't save the Madokans in the room because I thought I needed the Shrikel. So when I came back and entered the room again, I was shot instantly and taken back to a checkpoint. And it's here where the situation just kept repeating itself, making it impossible for me to rescue the Madokans down there. So it turns out what you're supposed to do is possess this slig, go down and spawn the other sligs and die, then as Abe, throw a grenade down to kill the sligs that spawned in. But because I killed the slig you need to possess and then got a checkpoint, I died and respawned, but the slig I needed to possess was still dead, and the sligs in the other room hadn't spawned. So I could no longer throw a grenade in and kill them because they weren't there yet, and as soon as Abe enters the room, the sligs spawn and kill him, making it impossible to progress. So anyway, a fourth time I loaded the game, but this time the Madoc encounter worked and I didn't softlock myself out of getting 100%. Needless to say, this section of the game is a little bit glitchy and it seems the developers didn't take into account that you could do things in a non-linear order and lock yourself out of getting Madokans. Also, I swear that the counter glitched and said I had three less Madokans than what I actually had but I can't be 100% sure on this. Still, having to replay this quite lengthy section of the game four times was extremely irritating. 
Imagine if I hadn't saved the game for ages and had to go back to Scribania or Paramonia. That would have been really bad. So yeah, my advice is to save quite often. However, this leads me on to another problem. When you save the game, instead of overwriting the last save, it creates a brand new save file. Which is actually good because you can go back to revisit earlier levels using all of your different saves. However, it means that you'll fill up memory cards extremely fast. A better solution for going back to older levels would be to just have a level select menu become accessible when you finish the game. Maybe telling you how many Madokans are in each area so you can find the secrets more easily. This would have solved two issues, one being the fact that some secrets are far too hidden, and the second issue being the save system having to create so many different files so you can go back in the game. Either way, despite being a bit of a weird save system, it actually came in useful for me and allowed me to get 100%, so I guess I shouldn't criticise it too much. Anyway, remember that door at the beginning of the game that was closed, creating a dead end after going on that train ride? Well, now the door's open, and you can finally explore more of Rupture Farms and see areas that you've never seen before. This is where we're introduced to Sliglocks, which are basically the same as the whistle puzzles with Abe, but this time you copy a machine and you have to be controlling a slig to mimic them. Perhaps more interestingly, we're introduced to slugs a bit more closely here, and learn that they aren't just mindless, rabid beasts, but they're actually extremely loyal to sligs. This means that if you possess a slig and start talking to a slug, you can get it to follow you and attack other sligs that are out of reach. It's an interesting mechanic, but I feel like because it comes into the game so late, it doesn't get much time to be fully developed, and it's rarely only ever used in this one way. It would have been interesting to see more complicated puzzles involving sligs and slugs, but I guess you can't have it all. So we know sligs can use their game speak for slig locks and to talk to slugs, but something I've not mentioned is they can talk to madokans, which is useful for shouting look out, which then makes them take cover so you can shoot over their heads and hit threats behind them. You actually end up having to do this quite a lot, and it always feels really cool to pull off. I should probably mention here that Abe's possession ability only works on sligs, hence why I've not mentioned the abilities of any of the other species in this game. I just thought I should clear that up in case anyone was wondering. This section of the game is formatted in the same way as the Scribania and Paramonia temples, where you go into a series of rooms and have to flick a switch to turn on a series of lights to open a door and progress. Only here in Rupture Farms, you go through two areas with rooms, rather than just one. Using everything you've learned up until this point, platforming, the shrikel, spirit rings, grenades, slig possession, slog control, stealth, and everything else, you finally reach the end. This ending portion of the game is a bit of a gauntlet where you control a slig to kill onslaughts of slogs, and use Abe and his spirit rings to kill a ton of sligs too. Then you finally turn off the power to rupture farms, only for Mullock to order everyone to be killed, and a countdown timer starts to tick down from two minutes. He's gonna blow everyone up! It's a mad dash to the boardroom where Mullock is supposedly hidden away safely. This section is insanely tense, and you navigate through bombs and meat grinders on a strict time limit, gain the power of the Shrikel by rescuing the final Madokan, and kill all of the Gluckens and Sligs in the boardroom, only for this to happen. <laughs> yeah, you remember how Abe was strung up at the start of the game waiting for Moloch to arrive? We've finally caught up with Abe's story, and Moloch walks into the room and orders his slig assistant to kill him by dropping him into a meat grinder which opens up below. If you rescued the majority of the Madokans, you'll get the good end in here, in which all of the people you've rescued get together and chant, creating enough power to cause a storm above Rupture Farms, which then causes a lightning bolt to crash down and kill Moloch and the slig instantly. I say instantly, Mullock has his clothes fried off first, revealing that Gluckens look kind of freaky underneath the suits. Big Face then teleports onto the scene and chants, teleporting himself and Abe to safety. 
Where all the Madokans is rescued celebrate and Abe stands on a stage, content in being the saviour. Big Face lifts his arm like the champion he is, but he lets himself down with a big old fart, and then the game ends. The 100% reward is a little bit underwhelming. It's a cutscene viewer, which is nice I guess and it's good you at least get something, but you've already seen all of these cutscenes in the game itself. Plus, you can't access this cutscene viewer again once you've left this screen. It should have appeared in the options menu or something, so you could go back to it. But wait, what's this at the bottom of the cutscene viewer? I don't recall seeing this in the game. Let's give it a watch together. Just because life is doomed, and everyone wants to eat you, doesn't mean there's no hope. You need to look within, if you want to be free. Well, I guess I didn't need any sleep tonight anyway. In all seriousness though, how goddamn creepy is this scene? It was created as an advert but never actually aired, and the weird AI TV thing, now known in the Oddworld universe as The Shrink, was never seen in any Oddworld game ever again, as of yet anyway. I can kind of see why to be honest, it's absolutely terrifying and way scarier than anything else featured in the game. This cutscene actually kinda makes the 100% reward worth getting because this is the only way you'll get to see the cutscene. Unless of course, you just go onto YouTube and type it in, or watch this video, but that's cheating. That just about sums up my thoughts on Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, a truly amazing game that's held up really well thanks to its amazing graphics, the gameplay variety, the controls that are tight and actually quite intuitive, and perhaps most importantly, its story and the universe it introduces to us. Being the first game in the series, I will admit that it has problems. Some of which I've mentioned in the review, like the lack of checkpoints, some sections which are basically trial and error, the save system being flawed, and secret areas being way too obscure at times. Then there's also some mechanics that feel underdeveloped, like the slig and slog relationship, and even the shrikel power-up, which is only used a few times at the very end of the game. And you could also argue that the game's on the short side, too. Another slightly annoying detail is that you can't talk to more than one Madokan at a time, which for the most part is fine because most of the puzzles and obstacles are designed around taking one Madokan at a time with you to make it more tense when you come back for another one because you've got more progress to lose if you die. However, there are some times where there's not even a puzzle or an obstacle involved and you just have to take a Madokan across a level and then go back and get another one when they could have just have both followed you in the first place. Plus, realistically, this doesn't make any sense. In the game's universe, why wouldn't Abe be able to talk to two people at the same time? A similar problem to this is that when you tell a Madokan to wait, they remain listening to you, so to talk to another Madokan, you either have to leave the screen and come back, or simply stand there and wait for them to start working again so you can talk to another Madokan. Plus, Madokans don't follow you off of ledges, making you say follow me again to force them to walk off. It's little things like this that could do with being smoothed over. But let's be honest here, despite me going on for ages about the flaws with this game, they're mostly all nitpicks, and when the rest of the game is as good as this, it's so easy to just look past the small issues the game has. There's so much attention to detail with the game that I haven't even delved into. But to talk about everything would take far too long, and this video is already pretty lengthy. But just a couple of things I like are how certain Madokans have different tones to their voices, which gives them more personality, and yet again is just another small thing that makes the game's world feel real. Hello. Hello. Follow me. Okay.
I love how when you go from one screen to another, there's a sweeping transition that moves in the direction you entered the screen from, which not only gives you a split second to react to the layout of the new screen, but also gives you a sense of motion and makes it feel less like a new screen, and more so like it's a connected world, which wouldn't be the case if it just cut to the next screen. There's so much to love here, and there's aspects I've not even spoken about, like the stealth elements where you can sneak in and out of shadows undetected, but to speak about everything the game has to offer would be insane. To sum up, this is an absolute must-play game in my opinion, and is the first game which introduced us to the universe of Oddworld. While other games expand on this universe, this one is the game that introduced it and its concepts, and it needs to be held in high regard because of that. One last thing I'll mention is that while playing this game for the review, I almost found myself wanting more of an explanation about certain things that the game shows us and tells us. For example, why is Abe able to chant and possess enemies when other Madokans seem incapable of this? Obviously the answer could just be that Abe is the chosen one to become the saviour of the Madokans, and because he's more spiritually linked because of this, he has access to abilities like possession and the Shrikel, whereas other spiritual Madokans have other abilities, like being able to gift spirit rings and with enough numbers even teleport and create storms. But the game doesn't really explain this, and you kind of have to read between the lines to come to these conclusions. Which leads you to think, are these conclusions even right? Another example of this is the Magog Cartel, who are seemingly a mysterious group of high-ranking Gluckens. But more of an explanation into this organisation would have been great, especially seeing as they appear to be the main antagonistic force, even being superior to Moloch. Don't get me wrong, I love the lore this game does have to offer, and certain things don't really need explaining, like for example what the Meechers are, because that's better as just being left as this mysterious thing. But still, some other things are more integral to the plot, and could have done with being explained more. I'm giving Oddworld Abe's Odyssey a 7 out of 10. From the amount of negative things I have to say about the game, that might be surprising, but the game is just absolutely amazing. Obviously I've played it before, and I already know that the graphics are incredible, the story and lore is amazing, and the characters are interesting and memorable, but one thing I was seriously impressed with upon replaying it with a critical eye is the variety the game has to offer. Almost every single level introduces several new gimmicks that are so well thought out and developed that it constantly keeps the game interesting, and not one time did it ever get boring. Something I've not really talked about much is the sound design, but needless to say, it's amazing. The music is quite minimal, but one thing I love is how it's dynamic and changes depending on the situation you're in. If you're undetected, it will be atmospheric but tense, Then if you're spotted, it'll quickly pick up with industrial drum beats. Then when you're in the temples, it's much more natural sounding with wooden instruments and more tribal drum beats. It's awesome stuff, and the whole game has such amazingly high production value that it makes it all the more disappointing when you come across a little nitpick. And I think this is because it just stands out so much against the rest of the game. So that's Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. This game would be extremely difficult to top, but that's exactly what Oddworld Inhabitants planned on doing with the direct sequel to the game, Oddworld Abe's Exodus. Now, with such a high bar to reach, would Abe's Exodus fall short of achieving its goal, or would it even surpass the original? You'll just have to wait until next time to find out, won't you? So, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Bye!